Hi, welcome back. Dennis Kennelly along with my uh, special guest, Mark Sullivan. We're here to talk about employment law, labor law, entertainment law, or any other legal questions you'd uh, prefer to bring up. The phone numbers, just to get them out there, uh, area code 661-298-5487 or 298-1220. So bring your questions on and uh, we'll happily answer them. We're talking about independent contractors and, uh, you know, the easy way out if you're hiring somebody is to call them an independent contractor because you have to keep very, very minimal records on them. The problem is if you're wrong, if you guess wrong, the state or federal government is going to come back at you and ask you uh, to provide records that you haven't kept and the presumptions are always going to be against you. So it's likely not worth the risk. It's very likely not worth the risk to misclassify. And the temptation runs everywhere. I mean, one of the things that you should remember, a little tip for all of us, uh, your homeowner's insurance, you can add very, very cheaply what's called a worker's comp rider, which means if you have somebody working at your house, be it a tree trimmer, uh, gardener, whoever, uh, if they trip and fall and hurt themselves, they're going to be covered by your workers' comp rider, and it'll cost you next to nothing, but you should notify your insurance company, and that's probably the best 5 or 10 bucks a month you'll ever spend. Most of the policies I've seen in California have that coverage in there. It's funny you brought that up because we had not discussed this beforehand, um, that there are some areas of law in California where people are, no matter what your understanding is, are they're deemed that is the law considers somebody to be your employee, whether you want them to be your employee or not. And one of those, and it's done to protect you. And one of those is the area of like home repair, classically like the tree trimmer, that there's a statute that uh, um, these types of repair people are under certain circumstances, which would fit, you know, the typical the tree trimmer, the home painter, or whatever, that will make them an employee as a matter of law. We were like, well, that could be terrible. Well, it's, it's not terrible because what it does, it means if they fall off a ladder, that if they don't have work comp insurance, that your homeowner's policy will act as your worker's comp insurance carrier. That's a whole other area, of course, hiring contractors. Um, everybody's tempted to use foolishly tempted to use the guy that doesn't have a license because he's cheaper. I always tell my clients it's there is no bargain big enough or good enough not to have a contractor who A, has a license, and B, if he's got employees, shows you that he's got a comp policy. Exactly. It's called a certificate of insurance, and it is just, it is essential. These are things that uh, uh, any reputable company is going to have uh, because they don't want to put themselves in a position where they're on the hook to pay and if they're on the hook to pay so are you yeah and it's and it's there's a me you look at the reports there's millions of ways to people smartly or unfaithful well, actually not fairly maybe go fall off ladders all kinds of crazy things happen but the liability can be enormous if it ends up in a in a lawsuit and um, of course in california one of the downsides of community property is that uh, your home is not a protected asset. A lot of people that come from the East Coast, I've, like, I've practiced law in Michigan, New York, and North Carolina, and people in those states, because they have uh, you know, English common law, basically. Homestead exemption. Homestead exemption, and they have tenancy by the entirety. So that uh, the husband does something where the husband gets sued, they can't take the house. Well, that protection doesn't apply in California. Exactly. Exactly. Um, so you have to have the insurance coverage. Um, but, uh, you know, the, the, the whole issue, it really cuts both ways, an independent contractor. I mean, it's, it's, it's a big worry for small businesses. And actually, if you're an employee and somebody wants to make you an independent contractor um, when you shouldn't be, that should be a matter of concern for you as well because, uh, uh, A, you're not going to be covered by a, a workers' comp policy. Yes, you could hire me or Dennis, and we can file a lawsuit that you should have been an employee and you should have the benefits, et cetera. Uh, but you know, life is too short. Exactly. I mean, who wants to buy a lawsuit? Right. And you may not succeed on it. There's a, it's a very complex, tortured area of the law. And there's, a, there's as many ways you can lose one of those lawsuits as you can win it. 
uh, the end result is if you're working as an employee, um, you want to be treated as an employee. Now, I know a lot of, I've had people call me up and they think it's the lottery. Hey, he misclassified me. I'm going to lay back in the weeds like a viper and then go to the DIR and file a claim. And I'm like, you know, take a hundred bucks and, you know, go to Laughlin and put it in the slot machine. I mean. Your odds are better. <laughs> yeah, your odds, your, at least your life's more fun. Let's put it that way. I don't know about the odds. Uh, it's, no, it's, it's truly, truly amazing. And uh, sitting around and, and waiting for the lottery to hit, it's not worth it. As soon as you, the time to address it is up front. Uh, what you've got to do is let people know, what do you mean I'm an independent contractor? Why? And there's a wonderful, if you go to the, of all places, the Internal Revenue Service website, there is a, uh, there's a so-called 20-point test. Yeah, it's laughable, actually, but... But it, it answers the questions, which is basically, uh, which is basically who's, got, who's got the right to control your uh, conduct? Well, I, I say it's laughable because they give you 20 points. Nobody meets all 20. So it always comes down to it's, you know, 50 shades of gray. That's exactly. That's like 20 shades of gray. I mean, so it's, again, it's, it's, um, it doesn't give you a lot of comfort. It doesn't give you a lot of comfort. There's some bright line tests, as you know, but they're, uh, very, they're, they're more, more often than not, it's a matter of judgment rather than a, a bright line test. Um, Ooh, that's a good question. Hey, Mark, we got a, we have our first question from the audience, a question from Stephen and Castaic. Uh, is Stephen on the line with us right now? Or? Oh, we have an email question. Sorry about that. Uh, Stephen asked, but one company wants to dictate hours and refuses to allow me breaks. Do I, have any, do I have any rights? The company says he's an independent contractor. Gee, sounds to me like, Mark, what do you think? Well, it starts off, you start off with the first question, are you or are you not a contractor? And that's this whole morass that I'm talking about. I can tell you if you go to the Department of Labor Standards Enforcement. DLSE. DLSE. And, you know, they have, they're in Van Nuys, they're in Santa Barbara. Those are the two offices that typically employees in the area I practice in, which I'm in Thousand Oaks, or Westlake Village. And be same in the Santa Clarita Valley, you'd probably be going to Van Nuys. But if you're more to the west, you'd be going to Santa Barbara. Um, opening, walking in the door, they presume you're an employee. The burden is on the guy that's classifying you as not being an employee to show you're not being an employee. So, if you're, if they classify you as being an employee, then they're going to bring down the whole world of uh, all of your your payroll rights. You're entitled to your breaks, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. The long and the short of it is um, that employer is setting himself up to have a lot of liability. Yes, basically the by the very nature of the question that you ask, he dictates hours and tries to tell you when you're working. Independent contractors are hired for a result. They're not hired to you know sit there and be watched. So uh, basically, if you get the result, you're entitled to do what you need to do, which includes taking breaks. And if they're trying to tell you, yes, we think you're an independent contractor, but you will work from X to Y, you will go, you will take a break or not take a break, you will go to lunch at this time, uh, they're beginning to flunk the test. Yeah, there's... Badly. They, they can set hours for an independent contractor under rare circumstances, but it has to be... You know, it has to be something, for example, somebody hires um, somebody to manage a business and says, I need someone there to manage it from 8 to 5, and they're just, you can do it any way you do it, and it's, they give you all the discretion, and you've got some expertise. Yeah, that person might be an independent contractor. Uh, but if you're doing a job that, you know, but for the label, you'd be an employee, you're an employee. Yeah, and Mark and I have an interesting case together right now, uh, which is living proof that a high salary doesn't necessarily make you exempt. We have a, we have a client that uh, works in the hospitality industry, and she made almost $100,000 a year. But if you looked at her job, she was doing non-exempt work. And we are convinced that a court will agree with us that she is not, uh, she's, not she's a non-exempt employee, she's not an independent contractor, and even though they're paying her a lot of money, they still owe her overtime and a bunch of other things. And that's the thing you're giving up as an independent contractor. 
because independent contractors are paid for the results. So if it takes you 50 hours to do it or one hour to do it, you get the same money. Uh, as if you're an employee, you get paid for the time you spend on the job, and that includes one of the most liberal overtime laws from the employee standpoint in the country. Uh, overtime after eight hours in a day or 40 hours in a week, and double time after 12. And that adds up. But now, you, but you can, there are circumstances, like I said, where you can be an independent contractor paid by the hour. And the one that comes to mind, and it's, this is a close question, but I think it comes down in favor of the, the hirer. Uh, if you hire somebody, let's say to be an armed guard, they've got to be licensed, and they've got to have their own insurance, and there's a lot of, you know, there's a, there's a lot of liability concerns, and you're not supervising them. You know, like, you know, an executive, you know, like a bodyguard type of person. That person is probably an independent contractor, but that's really kind of the exception. Now, it's interesting, though, what Dennis is just talk, talking about it is a, a very current affairs thing you're likely to see in the paper, is that last year there used to be a bright line rule under federal uh, wage an hour that you had to make more than, like, it was roughly $22,000 a year for it to be exempt from overtime. And that rule was written in, like, 1982 or thereabouts. Well, that was a lot of money. And that was a lot of money. And so the Obama administration raised it by executive order. They didn't have a statute. They raised it by, uh, uh, you know, regu regulation, I guess. It wasn't executive order, to $48,000. Now, there's a lot of talk about rolling that back because in some parts of the country, $48,000 is substantial money. It's not, obviously, in Southern California. If you've tried to pay rent here, you know that. But uh, that really has not been a hotbed, you know, hot issue in California because the California law, uh, by a, a, an order, was always 42 something thousand dollars and change. Um, so that, but you'll see reference to that issue on national, you know, television programs. It's not going to be a big issue in California. Uh, similarly, the other hot, hot issue in national uh, labor stuff is that there is now with a Republican Congress, there's a very good chance of enacting a federal right-to-work law. Uh, Thirty-two states have state right-to-work laws. A lot of people don't know what that means. That right-to-work law just means that if you're in a state, you have a right not to belong to the union. In the uh, 1930s era, in the traditional union states, one of the ones I practice in Michigan being an example, if the shop, if the, if the employer was unionized, if you wanted to work there, you had to belong to the union. Uh, California, because of its tradition, always had what was called an agency shop type of arrangement where you didn't have to belong to the union, but you still had to pay the dues because you were getting the benefit from it. Um, there's now a big effort nationwide, and I think it may very well pass this year, to a national right to work law. Will it affect California? Not very much because that the law in the state has always been pretty much, uh, pretty much a right-to-work law. Exactly, and that's something that the, uh, will, if there's a national right-to-work law passed, it will impact greatly uh, the private sector union membership even more so than it has, and it'll probably decline even further. But what will affect us is the Christensen's case, uh, people don't know cases, but last spring when Justice Alito died, there was a case going to the U.S. Supreme Court. I think it's Christensen. I, Justice it's, Scalia died. I'm sorry, yes. <laughs> I, what, who did I say? Justice Alito. <laughs> Excuse me. He's still with us. He's still with us. Judge, yeah. and sorry we hope you that. were I, anyway. <laughs> that was a mental lapse. But in any event, when he died, there was a case from California involving a teacher. And the issue was because it's the state that's the employer, is it different? Can the state require you to belong to a union? And she has a very strong constitutional argument. The Supreme Court split without Justice Scalia 4-4. There's an extremely good chance that issue will be back in front of the U.S. Supreme Court. And I would, I'm would i just guessing that the court will probably come down 5-4 that in California you don't have to belong to the public employee union. You don't have to pay the dues. This will be, it'll be a, 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 you know, absolutely a landmark decision that will dramatically affect employment in California. So, because uh, uh, at least public employment. Uh, so that's one that people should be watching. It, uh, um, it will really change the employment landscape. Um, 
I'm trying to think of other big issues. Those, those we, are the two hottest ones. I know, and we got another hot one coming in by text uh, to our email address. Just to give me the phone, give you the phone and the emails again. Phone is six six one two nine eight five four eight seven, or two nine eight one two two zero. The email is Dennis at hometownstation.com. And here's a really topical question, which one of the things that we like about this show is we try and find out and tell you how what's going on elsewhere impacts you. And we have a question now. Do immigrants now have to fear if, if they have an employment issue that they could have no rights to dispute in court or could lose their job with no legal protection? Not in California. Not, uh, yeah, the answer to that in California is no. There's, there are at least at least four separate statutes in California that say that um, uh, you know, immigration status, it's, it's just not relevant evidence. You cannot, uh, there, I, there, I can't even think of the circumstances under which you can bring that as an issue in a trial. And in fact, an employer would be committing an unfair labor practice and could be sued if an employer made an issue out of it. Now, it's a slightly different story if you have a federal lawsuit involving a federal cause of action. Let's say you have a claim, you know, under the Federal False Claims Act. Or, you or have the federal, National Labor Relations Act. Or you have a federal labor law question. Uh, but even under federal labor law, there, the Supreme Court has ruled that an employer doesn't have a free fire zone to take advantage of people because of their immigration status. Now. What would happen is if in, in the federal cases that if you were to sue and you don't have a lawful right to work in the United States, you have a right to get a remedy. You get your lost pay and your damages, et cetera, up to the date the of the trial. The day you were fired. Oh. Right, or the date you were fired. But the court can't obviously order you to get prospective, that is, going forward damages. Because, because you have no legal right to work. That's right. The court, the court can't be ordering the employer to do something that violates the law. Um, good question in California is is front pay, that's what they call that when they pay you in for prospective pay, is there a basically a federal defense to a front pay type of claim? No courts addressed it, they usually get away around it in California. Um, that, that would be a, a more complex issue uh, because it does involve the federal law and it's a pretty tricky a question of federal preemption. But to answer your question as simply as I can, and I don't think there's any simpler answer than a two-letter word, no. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. If, uh, and this, this has to do with whether you're here, whether you're a documented or undocumented uh, person. Because uh, can't, it can't be raised. It really can't. There is, there is, I can think of one exception, though, where there would be a concern, is if somebody has been deported and they return to the country. They, people don't understand this when they use the term, you know, you know, when they say an illegal alien. Well, if somebody's in the United States and they don't have authority to be here, it's a civil violation. It's not a crime. If, however, somebody is deported and then returns, that is criminal. And then you got a completely different issue because then you've got, you know, uh, that you you know you can be employed with an undisclosed crime. You know that's a that's a completely separate field. And where I'm assuming you're talking about somebody that doesn't have lawful status, has never been deported, and they have an, a you know a an employment law question. Can they sue? Will it be held against them? And my answer is a very complicated one. No. <laughs> <laughs> you're lucky that way. Uh, we've got more to come. And we'll be back in uh, about a minute. And while you're uh, while we're away, we have a little little fun and games at the end of the show. Brother Sullivan and I like to think of ourselves as sports trivia nuts. So if you've got a piece of sports trivia and you want to see if you can stump us collectively, feel free to do it. Because we're uh, both over the age of forty, we prefer questions involving older issues. But. <laughs> which hopefully only we can remember. So, look forward to hearing you on the other side. Thanks. Welcome back. Dennis Kennelly on the legal line, and hopefully we've got time for at least one more phone call. So the numbers are area code 
5487. Feel free to give us a call. If you want to email a question, it's dennis at hometownstation.com. We've been talking about independent contractors, whether you are or you aren't, and what the difference is from a legal standpoint. We've been talking with our guest, Mark Sullivan, who is uh, an old, old friend and professional colleague of mine. We're, uh, we've worked cases together in the past. We've opposed each other. Probably, I think our batting average is about 500 against each other. About that, yes. We had a, we had a ball. We really did. We were, uh, we were stationed over in Pearl Harbor, Hawaii in, uh, in our mid-20s, which was not a bad place to be. Uh, and the cases we have now currently, we uh, co-represent some employees and have a blast doing it. Uh, Mark? Uh, why don't you tell us how people, if they want to get in touch with you, can uh, can give you a call or email you? Okay. Yes, I'm admitted in five states, so make, that's my email address. It's Mark with a K dot Sullivan at Five State Law, all spelled out. F I V E S T A T E L A W dot com. I live on my computer. I'm there. I may doze, but I never close, and I do read all my email and I respond to it. Um, I'm on the internet. You could also call me, 805-277-7224. I'm in Westlake Village, 805-277-7224. Like I say, I do take calls, and I'm, my, uh, uh, you know, colleagues say I'm way too generous with my time, but uh, uh, I like talking to people, and uh, you know, I think that's part of the job, part of the profession. So I do welcome the calls, and uh, if I can't help you, because there, there's stuff that'll come up that. I will admit that I'm not the expert on, you know, I usually know somebody who is, and I'm glad to refer people. Um, you know, one of the things that's uh, in interesting about Mark that, uh, that he brings to the table that very few other lawyers do is his aviation experience, which is really, really cool. He's got almost 3,000 hours as a private pilot, has uh, multi-engine rating, and it's uh, just an extra benefit, plus... Uh, when we have cases together, if we need to go somewhere, we can jump in his plane, which is not bad. Yeah, I, uh, I represent pilots that uh, uh, are cited by the FAA. There's an, uh, an organization of pilots nationally, and I'm on their panel. Um, it's not a well-paying type of work, but I really enjoy doing it. And I'm also involved in a group in Camarillo that we're trying to get the FAA to give us permission to install high-tech equipment in vintage airplanes. My airplane is not a Learjet, it's a 1966 <laughs> vintage airplane. One of my passions is maintaining the airplane. I've got five sons, two are airline pilots, one works for Boeing, and two are mechanics. We're kind of into airplanes. I refer to the Sullivans as a high-flying family. But anyway, yeah, I also do aviation-related issues, and uh, I've represented pilots, which, by the way, does tie into what we're saying here today. One thing <clears throat> a lot of people don't realize but for the fact that they're in unions, pilots are not exempt from the overtime law. No, they're not. And a lot of people think, well, somebody that makes a large income, which it's not as large as it used to be, uh, they get overtime. So it's, you know, the, uh, the whole issue of whether or not you're exempt, it isn't necessarily driven by how much you make. It's what you do. Exactly. Especially in California, <laughs> they actually look <coughs> at, <coughs> at how you spend your day and what you actually do during that time that you're working. I mean, you can, you can have the hottest title in the world, but if you spend 90% of your time running the cash register, uh, you're not exempt. One of the highlights of this show is, as I probably told you, I'm a sports <laughs> trivia nut, and so is Mark. So we look forward to your questions at 661-298-5487 to try and stump us. But we got one to stump you, uh, and uh, this is uh, courtesy of Aaron Delatore, our engineer. Tom Brady uh, was a six-round draft choice by the Patriots. Why did Tom Brady last until the sixth round? There's a reason for it. He went to the University of Michigan. Where My alma mater. Mark Sullivan's alma mater. He's a graduate of Michigan Law School. And Mr. Brady didn't start. And our qu trivia question is, who did and whatever happened to him? So if you know the answer to that, uh, Mark and I will each give you 15 free minutes of our time. And you can ask any question you want. If you want to spend time talking about sports, we'd love to. 
So give us a question if you know who was the individual that Mark, that Tom Brady backed up. Uh, we got two minutes to wrap up, Mark, just to preview our next show. I'm going to try and, going to try and get uh, our old friend, the, uh, the Desert Fox, Jack Fitzgerald, to come on next week, another garrulous Irishman uh, who's probably the best employment lawyer on either side in the desert. And uh, Jack has got a, a lot of good things to say. We've, uh, we've both known Jack for a long time. Litigated with him and against him many times. As have I. Just a super guy. A, uh, as a Duke fan, he's a uh, uh, graduate of the U.S. Military Academy, and he was a classmate of Mike Krzyzewski, who's the Duke coach and the former U.S. Olympic coach with the count them three gold medals, which nobody else has. Yeah, I, I, I would note the... Uh, uh, since I have a small airplane, I do take cases literally all over the place. I do stuff in the Central Valley, and I do do a lot of stuff over in Indio and in Palm Springs. Um, that's how I got to know Jack Fitzgerald. Yeah, if Jack's coming in, I would, knowing Jack, is a Jack is a very entertaining guy, and he's a very good, very smart lawyer, and the law is, even though it's the same state law, things are just different once you get on the other side of the dinosaurs as they say out in Palm Springs. Absolutely. And I, I never walk into court in India without calling Jack first to get the lowdown on what's happening out there. Absolutely. Well, uh, just so you know, if you, want to, uh, if you want to talk to me about any legal issues, go to my website at Dennis Kennelly. That's K-E-N-N-E-L-L-Y.com, uh, DennisKennelly.com. I want to thank for our debut show the uh, station manager and owner Carl Goldman at KHTS Radio. I want to thank my producer, Emmy Award winning producer Laura Espinosa London. I want to thank my guest, Mark Sullivan. I want to thank my uh, engineer, Aaron Delatore. And we look forward to being with you next week, same time, same station, 1220 a.m. Good afternoon. <laughs>